I don't want you to think that we've come up with anything. We, we haven't. We're in a long line of people who have adhered to Scripture. And so we are, we are the recipients and the takers. Now Spurgeon had a motto for his college, uh, to hold and to be held. And I think, I'll ask you when I get to heaven, if I'm still interested in the subject when I get there, but I think what he meant by that was that we are held by the things we hold to. And we hold to the things that hold us. We are the recipients of this body of truth that's been handed to us from generation to generation. We're not trying to find, like the Athenians and strangers, some new thing. And we have died to self and we're perfectly content to be the recipients of a long line of truth that's made its way, winding through the centuries, to us. Sort of like carrying Joseph's bones, someone responsible generation after generation. Finally, when they came into the promised land, uh, Joshua of the tribe of Ephraim, which means he was a grandson way down the line of uh, Joseph, had the privilege of burying Joseph's bones in the promised land. And you and I are carrying Joseph's bones, figuratively. We're carrying the Word of God, and we want to give people what we've received without, without adding something to it or taking something from it. And so when we deal with the subject of individual soul liberty, the liberty of the soul, remember our founding fathers in this wonderful God-blessed country recognized the same thing when they penned the words life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are the unalienable rights that we've been endowed with. God has given us these things, life, and liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And they recognized something from the Scriptures. They recognize that God has given us a freedom, a soul liberty. We do not answer to the state for it. We answer to God for it. The state didn't give it to us. God gave it to us. And so our local church is a group of baptized believers who voluntarily join themselves together to carry out the Great Commission. And we identify ourselves as Baptist people. And we have certain distinctives of our faith. The Bible, the Word of God, is the sole authority for our faith and practice. If the Bible speaks about something, then we should speak about it to the emphasis that the Bible gives it. Finding that emphasis God gives is, is our work to do. And may God help us to place the emphasis where God places the emphasis. You ought to write that down. We need to place the emphasis where God places the emphasis. We have people of the book. If the Bible is silent on a subject, then we are to be silent on that subject. All that we believe and teach we find in the Word of God. When we say that the Bible is the sole authority, we're speaking of all the Scriptures, the whole and all its parts. We should preach the whole counsel of God. In the Bible we find the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. We should proclaim the gospel because Christ said that we're to take the gospel message to every creature. When we open the Bible, we open the 66 books of the Bible, we find more than the gospel. The gospel is in this book of 66 books. And of course, that scarlet thread of the gospel of redemption runs through all the Bible, but the whole counsel of God must be proclaimed. I say if we're going to be spiritual people, we must be scriptural people. It's impossible to be spiritual without being scriptural. And we need to know and to live the Word of God. I call your attention to a verse of Scripture in Romans chapter 14. We're reading verses 11 and 12. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So then every one of us shall give an account, shall give account of himself to God. In our nation we hear people talk about religious tolerance. Religious tolerance is something created by government. It's a gift from the government. It can be taken away by the government. I think it's one of the great battles that we're in now and will not cease to be a battle 
But we're dealing with something different. Religious tolerance is something man-made. Soul liberty is something God established when He created us in His image. We find a clear teaching of this in God's Word. Soul liberty is a gift from God. God's Word says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Soul liberty does not rest upon the legal documents of our nation. It is rooted in the Word of God. This individual freedom of the soul is inherent in man's nature as God created him. Man is responsible for his choices, but he is free to choose. Think of that. This may be a little confusing to you, but I say that I believe with all of my being in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I truly do. But I, I disagree just as sincerely with what some people choose with their liberty and their life and their pursuit of happiness. But I strongly urge you to understand that people have this inherent gift with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. One Baptist years ago by the name of J.D. Freeman in 1905 wrote this expression of this particular thing. Our demand has been not simply for religious toleration but religious liberty. Not sufferance merely but freedom. And that not for ourselves alone, but for all men. We did not stumble upon this doctrine. It inheres in the very essence of our belief. Christ is Lord of all. The conscience is the servant only of God. And is not subject to the will of man. This truth has indestructible life. Crucify it and on the third day it will rise again. Bury it in the sepulcher and the stone will be rolled away while the keepers become as dead men, steadfastly refusing to bend our necks under the yoke of bondage. We have scrupulously withheld our hands from imposing that yoke upon others. Of martyr blood, our hands are clean. We have never invoked the sword of temporal power to aid the sword of the Spirit. We have never passed an ordinance inflicting a civil disability on any man because of his religious views, be he Protestant or Papist, Jew or Turk or infidel. In this regard, there is no blot on our execution. And this is our record, of course. No blot on our record. Remember that when we're talking about individual soul liberty and the relationship of the church and the state. In America, the Constitution does not place the church over the state or the state over the church. The statement I read to you by a Baptist concerning Baptists and their conviction about soul liberty is most important. And most importantly, Scripture places them, the state and the church side by side, each operating independently of the other. This means there's freedom in the church and freedom in the state. Each is sovereign within the sphere of its authority, the authority God has given to each of them. And cross-reference Matthew chapter 22, verse 21. Read carefully this statement made by Charles Spurgeon. And this is taken from his Metropolitan Pulpit series. Spurgeon wrote, We believe that the Baptists are the original Christians. We did not commence our existence at the Reformation. We were reformers before Luther, before Luther or Calvin were born. We never came from the church of Rome, for we were never in it. But we have an unbroken line up to the apostles themselves. We have always existed from the very days of Christ, and our principles, sometimes veiled and forgotten like a river which may travel underground for a little season, have always had honest and holy adherence. Persecuted alike by Romanists and Protestants of almost every sect, yet there has never existed a government holding Baptist principles which persecuted others, nor I believe any body of Baptists ever held it to be right to put the consciences of others under the control of man. We have ever been ready to suffer, as our martyrologies will prove, but we are not ready to accept any help from the state to prostitute the purity of the bride of Christ to any alliance with government. And we will never make the church, although the queen, the despot over the consciences of men. 
this is a wonderful statement, and we have it printed in a form you can pass along to others, this marvelous statement. I'm rather troubled when I see so many people who claim to be Baptists who do not understand why they are Baptists. We should be able to defend our position and do it biblically. If we are people who know and love the Lord and His Word, and if the Bible is our sole authority for faith and practice, then we have no reason to be ashamed of the position we take. May God not only help us to take this position, but to take it with holy boldness and compassion. May He enable us to take His Word in hand and heart and defend what we believe to a lost and dying world. Let's continue now. Individual soul liberty. So much of what we have in our country to enjoy can be credited to Baptist people. For example, if you study the history of our nation, you will find that Virginia Baptists were almost solely responsible for the First Amendment being added to our Constitution. And by the way, Virginia was the largest, most populated of the colonies, the first of those, uh, the wealthiest most influential and was influenced greatly by Baptist people. We enjoy this freedom of separation of church and state and the freedom of, to worship as our conscience dictates because of the influence of Baptist people on the founding fathers of our nation. Now, I'm not going to get into this, but it was Jefferson who wrote a letter to a Baptist preacher thanking him for a 700-pound cheese. Read the story for yourself and use an expression on... The idea of a wall of separation. That, ex that language does not exist in our founding documents, but exists in a letter written by Thomas Jefferson after he received this gift from a Baptist preacher. But our founding fathers did understand they did not want a state church. Nine out of the first 13 colonies wanted a state church. But the Bible prevailed and we reached an agreement as a founding nation on individual soul liberty. This is so important, and I hope you understand that, and you credit where credit is due. We have a country that's been so influenced that we do not believe it is right to exercise any control or coherence over any, of any kind over the souls of men. From where did this conviction come? We find it in the Bible. Someone imparted it to the founding fathers. It became the law of the land and it should remain the law of the land. We need to understand it. It comes out of the clear teaching of God's word concerning the subject of soul liberty. Now, uh, my wife and I have had the privilege of going to England and other places around the world many times and we've seen places where people have been martyred for their faith, persecuted. And uh, it's a horrible thing. We found lots of places where Baptist people were persecuted and put to death, but we never found any place in our travels where Baptists persecuted anyone for their faith. And the cornerstone of our conviction, you say, well, I'm going to find people who may believe the Bible is a sole authority for faith and practice, and I may find other groups who believe in the autonomy of the local church and, and uh, the priesthood of believers and uh, other things I've listed here that you can read at your leisure about the, the little uh, acronym on Baptist. But the cardinal thing that I am most grateful for concerning the faith that I adhere to because it's biblical based is what we find on individual soul liberty. Now, uh, we follow men as they follow Christ. We're influenced by people as they've been influenced by Christ and influence our lives. But let's, let's decide on this that it is the truth they adhere to, biblical truth, that we choose to adhere to in the exercise of our own soul liberty. Now, this is going to change, or may I say, I hope, adjust the way many of us preach. All of us need this adjustment because you cannot make anyone become a Christian. I think sometimes in our, in our uh, educational institutions, we institutionalize things to the point that we think we can institutionalize Christian faith. Sort of like having an automobile factory. If you give us this and put him in at the front of the line and you pull him out at the end of the line, 
which means four years and so many credits later, we'll guarantee you this out of the other. That, that would be true if people were machines, but they're not. Christian education is an opportunity. It's not a guarantee. Now, some people want to make it a guarantee. I, I, I will not concede that it's a guarantee. I love Christian education. By the way, Christian education can't be confined to a classroom. It certainly can't be confined to an institution. It's God working in us that we might develop the mind of Christ to make choices that are God-honoring and allow the Lord's ruling presence in our lives. But just because a child enrolls in a Christian school or a young adult enrolls in a Christian college doesn't mean that you're going to produce, mass produce uh, great Christians from that. Because of the way God made us, we are susceptible to influence. As a matter of fact, when we understand the Creator, we begin with God, that's where we ought to begin. When we begin with God, we understand when we begin with God how God made us. He made us to communicate. He made us so He could communicate with us. He says, come let us reason together. We'll touch on this, God willing, before we leave uh, this pastor's college when we deal with uh, our conclusions concerning critical thinking, especially as we uh, look at the Bible, verses like 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. The choice is to be made. But I'm back to this expression. You cannot force anyone to be a Christian. You cannot force anyone to live the Christian life. You cannot force anyone into true Christian service. Now you might have Christian service requirements in a, a well-meaning institution, and I think that's good. But it doesn't mean they're serving the Lord from their heart. And that's to be reckoned with. I remember watching, a, I thought, a very good Christian school administrator discipline a young person one day. It happened to be a lady who was the head of this situation and she was disciplining another young lady. And she brought the young person to the point of seeing her personal accountability to God and saying things like this. Uh, do you believe the Lord was pleased with what you did? No. What would you do if you sought to please the Lord? How can we deal with this situation as it is now with failure and bad behavior we could even call sinful if we wanted to get it right with God and right with others? There were choices to be made. Now, you could force someone in that setting to do things, but it would not affect a dynamic change in the life of that individual unless he or she would choose to do it. Sometimes when we get to preaching, we get the idea, here's the orders, now you obey them. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And we turn that around and we feel like we've suffered personal rejection because people do not do what we want them to do. It's not me against them as pastor. It's not me against them. I'm trying to bring them to the point where they see their own personal accountability to God. And in doing so, I must recognize my own personal accountability to God and, by the way, to the people God has given me to pastor because that's an assignment the Lord gave me. And I answer to Him. So the approach you take in trying to get people to act upon something that you're talking about or preaching about will be transformed. That approach will be transformed once you truly understand individual soul liberty and the way God's made us. It will also help us with Christian education to understand that Christian education is an opportunity, not a guarantee. Now, we can make this thing like a science lab if you want to, and, and we can work for something, and this plus this plus this is going to equal an explosion. If you want to do that, that's fine. But what about will? Or we can lock someone in a, a cell of some kind and tell them they're all alone and not even open the thing up so that they have any kind of light. 
and say, say to them, uh, you have to believe a certain thing. But there's no way, even though they're incarcerated, that they can be forced to believe a certain thing. It cannot be done. Why cannot you do that? Why can it not be done? Because of the way God has created us with individual soul liberty. Now, another thing we must add to that is that we're not laboring on our own. We're laboring with God, labors together with God. While we're working, we're working with God because the Lord is in the world reproving or convicting of sin, righteousness, and judgment. There's another audience to whom we answer and another audience we're working with. We're co laborers with the Lord. And if we're doing right, truthful, biblical things, we can know that we're laboring together with God and God is working in people's hearts. All of that is based on the idea of understanding individual soul liberty. And sometimes what we call fundamental Baptist, and I don't refer to myself as a fundamental Baptist unless I can unless I can define fundamentalism. So many people reject fundamentalism because of a fundamentalist. But I, I say I am a fundamentalist if you say that fundamentalism is synonymous with biblical Christianity. If it's some half-beat man-made idea and, and some attachment that somebody's made to Christian faith that suits them subjectively, I'm not for that. But if you can say that fundamentalism is when speaking of it means we're speaking of biblical Christianity, I'm perfectly at ease with that. But some people get the idea that many strong people who have strong convictions about the Bible are trying to force people to their way of thinking. Nothing could be further from the truth. Because people who have strong convictions about the Bible, who have an understanding of scriptures, are the first to realize that you can't make a Christian out of anyone. You can't force anyone to be a Christian, to become a Christian, or to live the Christian life. So that brings us to personal accountability to God. We find this accountability in the opening verses of God's Word. When God created man, He created man capable of giving personal account of himself to God. Now think of that. I honestly believe when, when Adam had a, entered into a deep sleep, that I, I believe that he got... God spoke to him about it and Adam gave permission to the Lord. God didn't force him to go to sleep. But he trusted God for that help meet and God caused a deep sleep to come over him and he was certainly delighted with what he found when he woke up. Thank the Lord for that. But you don't find God dealing, dealing roughshod with people and uh, now I'm his. I'm his as a child of God. He do with me as he pleases. I've been born of his spirit. He lives in me. I'm his property. I'm a peculiar person, meaning one who belongs to God. And uh, he's entirely the boss. When he's finished with me, he can take me home to be with him, whatever he chooses to do. But let's look again at Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. The Bible says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Men were made in God's image. And when God made us in his image, he made us with the ability to choose. Eve was deceived, but Adam chose to die rather than to live without Eve. He willingly chose to disobey the Lord. Now, it is not right, never will be right, never has been right to try to force one's religion or belief upon another individual. I think one of the places where this is most easily recognized is when parents have children, they want their children to be Christians. But true Christians recognize their children have professed their own faith in Christ. That's a delicate area. Hands on, hands off, hands on, hands off, hands on, hands off. Areas in life where you put hands on. <laughs> but area of life with a person's personal relationship with God, we take hands off. There are guidelines about godly things. But recognizing that salvation is of the Lord, it's a work that God must do and will do in the heart of a person. Take that attitude when you're trying 
to deal with your own people as a pastor. I cannot be a dictator. Oh, I'd like to be at times because I know I know what's best for people. But I cannot be a dictator. Cannot. Now, I've been given the position to pastor the church, to shepherd the church and their decisions I make and I say we're going to go in this direction. But forcing people to go is another matter entirely. I'm just pleading for this. To see the stronger church is not the church that's driven. Please get that. The stronger church is not the church that's driven. A lot of that's because of the insecurity of the leader trying to make people appear a certain way because they think it, he thinks it flatters him. But the stronger church is not the church that's driven. It's the church that's led and we lead them to follow Christ. We bring people to their personal accountability to the Lord. This is all based on our personal accountability to God. The Bible says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's the only way to God. In this age of tolerance, people say that nothing is really wrong. The same people who say that no way of believing is wrong will not accept the truth that one belief can be the only way that's right. How, how do we deal with exclusivity and soul liberty? Now that's a big question. How are you going to go into a place and say uh, there is exclusivity in the fact that there is just one way to Jesus Christ? One way to God through Jesus Christ. God declared that. But yet you have the liberty to choose that way or to reject that way. That's the battle we're in. And we'll talk about New Testament preaching and where we find that in New Testament preaching. But it is an issue with which we must deal. No human being is going to live on this earth without being sinned against by others. Many children are greatly sinned against by their own parents. However, we cannot go through life blaming others for the person we are because God has made us in such a way that we have an individual accountability to God. This comes out of our soul liberty, our right to choose and respond to things in a way that God would have us to. God has made us in His image. Again, He did not make us puppets or robots. He made us people created in His image with the ability to choose our own way. Romans 14, 11 says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. We are responsible because we have direct access to God. God has given us the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, and access to the throne by prayer. We therefore must personally answer to God at the judgment seat since God communicates to us directly. Now, we live in a country where there are many false religions. As Baptist people, we would defend the right of anyone in our land to worship as he sees fit. Now, that's difficult, but that's our position. This is unheard of in most of the world. If a man is a Muslim, I do not agree with his Islamic religion, but I must defend his right to worship as he sees fit. The clear teaching of the Catholic Church takes that salvation comes through Mary. Now, this is not the teaching of the Bible. And we must take a stand against false religions. But we must also defend the right of people to worship as they choose to worship. Why? Because individual soul liberty is a gift from God to every human being. If the Bible teaches individual soul liberty and personal accountability to God, then it is a truth that will endure to all generations. Let me share with you as quickly as I can Bunyan's account of his imprisonment. <laughs> and just as a side note, you know, John Owen tried 12 years to get John Bunyan out of prison. He felt like the greatest failure of his ministry was failure to get Bunyan out of prison. There's a great lesson to be learned in that. But if he had succeeded in getting Bunyan out of prison, his friend Bunyan out of prison, we would never have had Pilgrim's Progress. Which is, within reason, at least at one time in American history, the most, second most influential book ever written. Think of that. 
I just got in my hands recently uh, sketches by White, Alexander White, W-H-Y-T-E, from um, Edinburgh, Scotland, on, on uh, Bunyan's characters. And uh, I'm, I'm threatening to make that a, a course in, in Crown College where we all are reading Pilgrim's Progress now, but where we study White's characters. It is the most amazing set of books that you can get your hands on, and I'm just thrilled with having it myself, and I've had such pleasure reading it. Bunyan's characters. God really worked in John Bunyan's life. And uh, listen to this. Bunyan's the man who gave us Pilgrim's Progress. This wonderful book was planned during Bunyan's prison experience and written when he was released. The trial of John Bunyan took place October 3rd, 1660. Try to place things in context. What else was going on? You know, how many thousands of preachers were put in prison? Not just Bunyan. Who was on the throne in England? What was happening in America? Uh, try to put yourself in the place. and It, it was quite a time. Bunyan spent 12 years in jail for his conviction about individual soul liberty, failure to attend the Church of England, and for preaching the Word of God. During his trial, John stood before Judge Wingate, who was interested in hearing John Bunyan state his case. Judge Wingate said, In that case, then, this court would be profoundly interested in your response. And he got it. Part of Bunyan's response is as follows. I, I'm intrigued and thrilled with this. I'm glad the record was found, preserved. Thank you, my Lord. And may I say that I am grateful for the opportunity to respond. Firstly, the dispositions which speak the truth. I have never attended services in the Church of England, nor do I intend ever to do so. Secondly, it's no secret that I preach the Word of God whenever, wherever, and to whomever He pleases to grant me opportunity to do so. Quite an opening statement, isn't it? Having said that, my Lord, there is a weightier issue that I am constrained to address. I have no choice but to acknowledge my awareness of the law which I am accused of transgressing. Likewise, I have no choice but to confess my guilt in my transgression of it. As true as these things are, I must affirm that I neither regret breaking the law nor repent of having broken it. Further, I must warn you that I have no intention in further and future of conforming to it. It is on its face an unjust law, a law against which honorable men cannot shrink from protesting. In truth, my Lord, it violates an infinitely higher law the right of every man to seek God in his own way, unhindered by any temporal power. That, my Lord, is my response. Now remember that Bunyan was responding as to why he would not do all that he was doing for God within the confines of the Church of England. And the transcription goes on. Judge Wingate speaks. This court reminds you, sir, that we are not here to debate the merits of the law, we're here to determine if you are, in fact, guilty of violating it. John Bunyan. Perhaps, my Lord, that's why you're here. But it's most certainly not why I'm here. I'm here because you compel me to be here. All I ask is to be left alone to preach and teach as God directs me. As, however, I must be here. I cannot fail to use these circumstances to speak against what I know to be an unjust and odious edict. Judge Wingate. Let me understand you. You are arguing that every man has a right given him by Almighty God to seek the deity in his own way, even if he chooses without the benefit of the Church of England? Bunyan, that is precisely what I'm arguing, my Lord, or without benefit of any church. Wingate, do you know what you're saying? What of a papist and Quakers what of pagan Mohammedans? Have they the right to seek God in their own misguided way? Bunyan, even these, my Lord. Wingate, may I ask if you are particularly sympathetic to the views of these or other such deviant religious societies? Bunyan, I am not, my Lord. Wingate, yet you affirm a God-given right to hold any alien religious doctrine that appeals to to the warped minds of men? I do, my Lord. 
Wingate, I find your views impossible to believe. And what of those who, if left to their own devices, would have no interest in heavenly things? Have they the right to be allowed to continue unmolested in their era? Bunyan, it is my fervent belief that they do, my Lord. Wingate, and on what basis, might I ask, can you make such rash affirmations? Bunyan, on the basis, my Lord, that a man's religious views or lack of them are matters between his conscience and his God and are not the business of the crown, the parliament, or even, with all due respect, my Lord, of this court. However much I may be in disagreement with another man's sincerely held religious beliefs, neither I nor any other may disallow his right to hold those beliefs. No man's rights in these affairs are secure if every other man's rights are not equally secure. I don't know if anyone who could have, I don't know if anyone who could have expressed it, the whole idea of soul liberty any better than Bunyan expressed it in 1660. Every man can seek God as he pleases. This means that we cannot force our religion or teaching on anyone. It means clearly that no one can be coerced into being a Baptist and believing what we believe. It means that we can do no arm twisting or anything else of that sort to make anyone believe what we believe because every man has been created by God to be able to choose to follow God or to follow some other God. Personal accountability to God is a distinctive of our faith. It is something we believe and out of this distinctive comes other distinctives that we identify as with other Baptist people. Now, let's talk about the priesthood of every believer. The priesthood of every believer means that every believer can go to God through the merits of Jesus Christ. Christ and Christ alone is the only way to God. All of us who have trusted Christ as Savior enjoy the glorious privilege of the priesthood of the believer and can access God through the merits of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May I read 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1-6. through 6. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may live a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God, of God our Savior. And we will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be saved testified in due time. This is to be specially noted in verse 5. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Any man anywhere in the world can go to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now I'm going to stop right here and say, as a preacher of the gospel, this attitude toward God and the way God has created man should affect in a great way our attitude toward our people. We are not their priest. We are not their dictator. Somewhere you ought to write down, my influence should never dictate, it should only permeate. My influence should never dictate, it should only permeate. You have access to God, you can personally talk to God. You can take your needs to the Lord. Whatever your needs are, you can take those needs to the Lord. You as an individual Christian can go to God through the Lord Jesus Christ who is your high priest we have a liberty to make intercession for you. We have no merit of our own. We don't accumulate merit. The Bible teaches the personal accountability of every human being to God. Now, I read this. Think of how wrong it is to take babies and allow them later in life to think they've become Christians by an act of infant baptism. Yes, they have a right to practice infant baptism, but we do not believe this is biblical because faith cannot be forced or coerced on anyone. 
If I have discovered the truth in Christ and believe that God's word is inerrant, infallible, and eternal, certainly I want my own children to believe that. I have no greater joy than they walk in truth. But I cannot make my sons Christians. They must choose Christ of their own will. I want them in heaven. But they have to repent of their sin and personally trust Christ as Savior. Now here is where it all comes. Our personal accountability to God, the priesthood of every believer. Our personal accountability to God, the priesthood of every believer. But here's where it all comes. That is the power of influence. So what weapon, what tool do we have? What do we have? Where does this teaching of priesthood of every believer and personal accountability to God lead us? It leads us to the realization of the importance and the power of influence. This is the tool God has given us. And I give an Old Testament example about the days of the judges. Every man did what's right in his own eyes. And then Ruth in that setting, the book of Ruth, and how God worked testifying of himself in the midst of that generation. I quote to you Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Now, I, I want you to think about this. The more churches become like the world, the less influence they're going to have in the world. What so many are attempting to do in order to build up their ministries is what will actually cause the demise of their ministry. Even though we cannot force people to become Christians, they wouldn't try. It's not right to violate another person's will. We need to use our influence. How do we gain the most influence? And I, I do, deal here with the subject of our separation to God and from the world. Now, I, I want to say something and I want you to write it down because I'm, I'm convinced that there's so much confusion about it. Separation is not the enemy of evangelism. Separation is not the enemy of evangelism. Let's establish that. Now let's talk about separation. When I'm talking about biblical separation, the doctrine of biblical separation, it's separation to the Lord and from the world. To the Lord and from the world. Christ separates us. I hope you're familiar with L.E. Maxwell. Write that name down, would you? L.E. Maxwell. And find a copy of his book, Crowded to Christ. One of the appendix I give you is as a pastor's and Christian worker's book list that I've compiled for 40 years. It's in your second notebook. I hope you'll use it. But read that book, Crowded to Christ. But try to get an understanding. Seek the Lord for an understanding of what true separation is. It's like the Christian home. You don't have a Christian home because of everything you take out of it. There are many people who think, I've created a Christian home by removing everything that's not Christian from it. You don't have a Christian home because of what you remove from it. You have a Christian home because of what you put into it. And we'll deal with that in one of the lessons here, which is one of the signature things we, we talk about. Separation to the Lord. Separation to the Lord. Now let's, let's review in our thinking just for a moment. If we, if we truly believe that we have a personal accountability to God, and do you believe that? Amen. And we believe as, as believers in the individual priesthood, the priesthood of every believer, that we can go to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's made a way. Then how do we get our work done? You can't force people to believe it. You can't make people believe it. You can't even force people to come to church. All you might say to a volunteer group of people, if you're going to teach a class, you ought to be faithful to the services. And they agree to it. And by the way, they should agree to it. They should make those agreements and obligate themselves instead of you obligating them. 
But how do you get work done? It's by the power of influence. Now, notice very carefully what I'm going to say because this is one of the pivotal points in this pastor's college. If, if our weapon, if we may call it a weapon, is the power of influence, as we diminish that influence by worldliness, and it's being diminished by worldliness in churches, then we're laying down the one thing that we have access to to get God's work accomplished. Look like the world, talk like the world, dress like the world, speak like the world, sing like the world, be a pulpit communicator like the world. How far will it go? Let me show you something. It's either man-centered or Christ-centered. It can't be both. Once it becomes man-centered, and by the way, uh, this old nature always wants it to be man-centered. There, there is no limit to how far that man-centered can go. You see, just like Moses made choices, he also made refusals on seeing him who's invisible. Seeing him who is invisible, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God, but he also refused. Now, as we separate ourselves to Christ, there are choices we make that honor and please him, but there are refusals also. Christ determines the choices. Christ determines the refusals. There may be things that are just weights that are not sinful things, could, could become sinful, but they are weights that should be laid aside because they don't honor the Lord like they ought to honor the Lord, and they're dangerous. I remember uh, having to go in a store to get change, and I didn't notice what it was, but I, I, I pulled into a parking lot, and it was a package store selling alcohol, and a man came came to greet me and I realized what I was there. I said, no, no, I'm sorry, I can't go in. And he, he really lost it. I said, I'm a Christian. I'm trying to maintain a testimony. I don't want to see anybody coming out of here. Even though I just need change for this to go. I didn't realize what parking lot I pulled into. That happened once. But you say, well, maybe you're being too cautious. I don't think so. And I may have done a lot of things worse in life than that, but but who makes the choices? Someone makes the choices for me. I choose. I don't blame God for the wrong choice I've made. But His presence in my life, identifying with Him or not identifying with Him. Now, I'm grieved. I'm grieved in my heart to see so many powerful, powerless churches Powerful, almost churches of renown, powerless churches. Mr. Spurgeon was preaching one day in London, England, and he said, A man has prayed a hole in heaven in Washington, Georgia. He's prayed a hole in heaven. His name is E.M. Bounds. Small church, never was a large church. But E.M. Bounds wrote many wonderful books that last to this moment, and they're classics on prayer. Now, did he have to have the greatest, biggest, showboatest, largest Easter service? Um, I mean, honestly. But you and I have fallen prey to this. And we let our people fall prey. Now, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a flip side to that. Don't use it as an excuse to do nothing. The hardest workers should be the workers who work because of what Christ has done for them, not in order to do something. When you put the cart before the horse, 
you got it wrong, right? And when you put the work before the Lord, you've got it wrong. We serve God because of what God has done for us. We should be willing to do more, pour our hearts and lives more into God's work because of what the Lord's done for us than we would be motivated by doing something to accomplish something. Christ should be greater in our lives than the goal of accomplishing whatever it is. I'm telling you there's a revolution back to the Bible that needs to take place. We're never going to have church planting or, or great missionary endeavors like generations of the past had. We can produce what men can do. But we need more than what men can do. We, we really do. God helping us, we really do. So the power of influence, and we must not diminish our influence by becoming so worldly. If the salt loses its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? You know what? I understand if you can't force people to be Christians, but every man can answer to God and there's individual soul liberty and a believer enjoys the blessed privilege of access to God through the priesthood of every believer, but you can't make him do what he ought to do, then the tool God gives us is the tool and the weapon God gives us is a weapon of influence. Then we ought to make the most of that influence. Now here's how. My human best filled with God's Spirit. My human best filled with God's Spirit. My human best filled with God's Spirit. Did I say to you early on that I don't speak to be heard, I speak to be repeated? And you'll see exercises we have in our church at times. I say to our people, now would you take what I've said? I speak, spoke Sunday. This is bad, 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 bad. I spoke Sunday on 17 things. If I had told the people that, they'd have got it and walked out before I spoke on it. I spoke on seven things Sunday morning and ten things Sunday night. And I hurried through it. I have the simplest way of delivery and sermon preparation of anybody in the world. We can talk about that someday. And I knew that I only had a certain lot of time to cover all these things, so I didn't spend a lot of time on it. I preached on the table of contents for the book of Proverbs on Sunday evening and 10 things are in the table of contents and you're going to find it on your own. But I had people write down the table of contents and then when we finished the table of contents and talked about those things, especially ending up at the end about discretion, I said to our people, now you take the notes you've taken and explain to someone next to you what the table of contents is, what you're going to find if you plunge into the book of Proverbs. And they did that. I want them not just to hear, but to repeat what they've heard. If you and I truly believe in individual soul liberty, then we will stop trying, listen, we will stop trying to manipulate our churches. Because we recognize the way God made people, even if you could force them to do it, it wouldn't make it stronger. We'll stop that. We'll recognize that people have access to God. That's one of the, the things that uh, added to salvation, not adding salvation, but things that accompany salvation is access to God and the individual priesthood of every believer. And we know that what we've really got here, let me live the best Christian life possible. May I shine for Jesus. And may I have the right attitude and the right spirit God, give me the greatest influence I can have for your glory. By the way, we won't have the filling of His Spirit if it's not for His glory. Fill with your Spirit, giving my human best, and use it for the Lord's glory. I believe it's revolutionary. I really do. It's one of the signature things we try to teach here. I think it's one of the differences in our, our church and schools. And it's not, it's, it didn't originate with me. It's just what I've been taught, and so I feel like I'm responsible for teaching it to others.